This is a true story. The reconstructions are based on an original air traffic control transcript. In 1998, off Canada's east coast, a modern passenger jet, run by one of the world's best airlines, catches fire at 33,000 feet. In the final six minutes, communications from the cockpit cease. It's burning already! Then, the plane plummets into the ocean. Two hundred and twenty-nine people are dead. What caused the fire is a mystery. Many of the vessels uh, reported to the Canadian Navy vessel standing by on scene that they were finding bodies and making repeated requests uh, for more body bags to get the bodies that were Now, vehicles. after one of the largest investigations in aviation history, the complete story behind the loss of Swiss Air Flight 111 can finally be told. It's a wake-up call for the entire airline industry to ensure that what happened aboard Swiss Air would never happen again. September 2nd, 1998. Swiss Air Flight 111 prepares to depart New York's JFK International Airport en route to Geneva, Switzerland. The aircraft is a McDonnell Douglas 11, or MD-11, a model first developed in 1986 as a highly automated, modern improvement on the antiquated DC-10. It is considered one of the most reliable large passenger jets in the skies, and Swiss Air pilots are among the world's best trained. Okay, after start checklist. Um, engine anti-ice. Not required. Roger, not required. Take off. Swiss Air 111's pilots are Captain Urs Zimmerman and First Officer Stefan Lowe. Swiss Air 111, hold short. 3-1 left. Zimmerman encourages an easygoing atmosphere in the cockpit, but he is also known for his by-the-book precision. When not flying, he trains new pilots for Switzerland's national airline. Uh, flaps and slats. Flaps set 15 degrees. Set at 15. On board are 215 passengers, 12 crew, and the two pilots. Most passengers are French, American, or Swiss. Among them is 23-year-old Stephanie Shaw, on her way home to her parents in Geneva. Stephanie uh, was blessed in many ways. She was uh, physically very attractive. She was an intelligent girl. She, uh, the reason she went to New York was that she had been invited to become a member of the world economic forum which is based in Geneva and she wanted to have this trip um, before she joined. She was a darling, she was an absolute darling. Swiss Air 111 heavy, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, Roger, Swiss Air 111. In the spirit of safety, the Swiss Air pilots push the throttles forward together, ensuring that no single pilot can botch a takeoff. We are B2. Swiss Air Flight 111 lifts off the runway and makes her way northeast toward the open Atlantic. For the first 15 minutes after takeoff, there is no communication from Swiss Air 111. It is an unusual small detail that would later baffle investigators. Atlantic air traffic is handled by a remote center in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. Almost half an hour after takeoff, Captain Zimmerman makes his first communication with Moncton. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, good uh, evening, level 330. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, Moncton Center, good evening. Reports of uh, occasional light turbulence at all levels. Moncton, Swiss Air. It is a perfectly normal beginning to a transatlantic crossing. In first class, Swiss Air passengers are among the first in the world to have a personalized in-flight entertainment network. Though now common, the system is an innovation in 1998. Passengers can choose their own movie, browse the internet, and gamble. They uh, evaluated the market and they thought that introducing a modern in-flight entertainment system combined with a gambling system 
so the passenger actually can use the credit card and gamble during long range flights um, would make them more attractive. This luxury would be the source of controversy to come. Roger, you have control. First Officer Lowe investigates the area near the air conditioner vent. Harmless smoke traces from air conditioning systems are common on commercial jets. I don't see anything, Ers. There's nothing up there now. You yelled for me, Captain? Stefan and I were sure we smelled smoke a few seconds ago. Can you smell anything? I smell it too, yeah. Could you smell it in the cabin before you came in? No, definitely not. They agree the air conditioner is the likely culprit. Can't see it or smell it anymore. Air conditioning, is it? Yeah. Please close it, thanks. Behind the sealed panel, the pilots cannot see that the problem is getting worse. Less than 45 seconds after smoke disappeared in the cockpit of Swiss Air 111, it's back. Zimmerman follows Swiss Air procedure. He makes plans to divert the plane for the nearest place to land. Find the closest place to land, Stefan. We'll need the nav charts from the library, uh, also weather data for the area. Boston's close. Not doing well at all up there. Zimmerman radios air traffic control in Moncton, New Brunswick. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, good evening. United 920 Heavy, Moncton Center. The controller exchanges information with another aircraft before responding to Swiss Air. Other aircraft calling, say again. Swiss Air 111 Heavy is declaring pan, pan, pan. We have smoke in the cockpit. Uh, request um, uh, immediate return to a convenient place, I guess. Boston. Pan, pan, pan is an international term used to notify air traffic control of an urgent situation, one step below declaring mayday. You said Boston you want to go? Uh, I guess Boston. Uh, we need for some weather there. Uh, we are starting right turn here, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. Swiss Air 111, roger, and ascent to flight level 310. 310. 310, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. This is the first interview with one of the air traffic controllers in Moncton. My name is Bill Pickerel, and on September 1998, September 2nd, 1998, I was one of two Halifax terminal controllers uh, working the evening shift. The pan uh, in any kind of a special uh, condition is usually dealt with uh, as an emergency, and this, in fact, was dealt with that way. The aircraft was immediately given priority, and the uh, high-level supervisor initiated the call to the rescue coordination center. Pickerel's colleague determines that Swiss Air 111 is just 66 nautical miles from Halifax and 300 from Boston. But pilot Zimmerman has chosen an airport he knows. A lot of times when you're having a problem, you would rather be dealing with an issue where you're much more familiar with the airport because that relieves a little stress on you. This is an initial problem. He's sitting there, he's looking up there, and he's trying to think, well, I've got smoke here. Now, what does it mean? Let's see, where, where are we? where's the closest place I can go to that I can talk to a Swiss Air mechanic? Boston. Swiss Air 111 Center. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, go ahead. Would you prefer to go into Halifax? First, we better put the mask on. Uh, stand by. Realizing their location, Zimmerman decides Halifax is the best option. Affirmative, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. We prefer Halifax from our position. Swiss Air 111 Roger, proceed direct to Halifax to send now to flight level 290. Level 290 to Halifax, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. 
the controller signs off with another aircraft. His jurisdiction is high altitude flights. As Swiss Air is on descent to Halifax, he hands over responsibility to terminal controller Bill Pickerel. At that point, uh, everything was normal. Uh, I, I gave the pilot an initial descent and uh, he requested to level off at an intermediate altitude to get the cabin in order for the landing, which I took to mean that they needed to pack away dinner trays and uh, things like that. It was an indication to me that uh, uh, while his situation was unusual, uh, that uh, they weren't considering it as uh, an emergency at that time. Watch your speed, Stefan. Don't descend too fast. Roger. Now we have smoke in the cockpit here. Have the uh, cabin crew prepare for landing. We'll be setting down in Halifax in about 20 minutes. I'm about to start the checklist here. Yes, Captain Zimmerman. Zimmerman has two checklists for smoke in the cockpit. To complete both will take 20 minutes. This is Swiss Air Company policy. In the meantime, Lowe continues the descent into Halifax. Stefan, I'll need you to handle the radio while I... It is checklist, all right? 119 or point two for the Swiss Air 111 heavy. Roger. Swiss Air 111 is now at about 25,000 feet. Pickerel advises them to descend to 3,000. But First Officer Lowe says he'd rather fly at 8,000 until the passenger cabin is cleared. His decision to remain high underscores the sense of control in the cockpit. Uh, From my point of view, it uh, gave all initial appearances that it should be a fairly straightforward operation, that uh, assuming that uh, everything happened normally, the aircraft uh, would require a minimum of handling to uh, uh, lead him into Halifax. Swiss Air 111, you can descend to three, level off at an intermediate altitude if you wish, just advise. But Pickerel is concerned the plane is not coming down fast enough. It appeared that the aircraft uh, might have been a little bit high, and uh, I wanted to ensure that the pilots were aware of how uh, far they were from the airport, how many miles they had to fly, so that they could uh, judge their own descent and make their decision about what they wanted to do. Roger, at the time we descend to 8,000 feet, and we are clear at any time to 3,000 feet. I give you advice. Okay, can I vector you uh, to set up for runway 06 at Halifax? Uh, Roger, vector for six will be fine. Swiss Air 111 heading. Swiss Air 111, Roger, turn left heading up uh, 030. Left heading 030 for the Swiss Air 111 heading. Zimmerman needs information for the unfamiliar airfield, but his flight bag is out of reach. He summons the flight attendant to help. You help me, Captain. For two minutes now. I need that flight bag there. It's got the approach charts for Halifax. <laughs> Take it back to your crew. Yes, Captain. This is your major the cabin speaking. The chief flight attendant notifies passengers that the flight is being diverted. There is no panic. The plane is flying normally, and there is no sign of smoke in the cabin. Swiss Air 111, the localizer frequency is 109 or decimal niner. You've got 30 miles to fly to the threshold. Uh, we're going to need more than 30 miles. But still, at more than 20,000 feet, Swiss Air 111 is too high to make a landing in 30 miles. Zero. The frequency is a 109 or decimal niner for the localizer. Okay, Roger, 109 or point niner. And uh, we are turning left, heading uh, north. Swiss Air 111 heavy. And we've got to dump fuel. Agreed. So far, communications from Swiss Air have been calm. Still, Moncton Center initiates emergency efforts at Halifax Airport. Preparing ground crews for the landing of Swiss Air 111, Pickerel seeks more information. Swiss Air 111, you have time. Could I have your number of souls on board and your fuel on board, please, for emergency services? Roger. At this time, fuel on board is 230 tons. We have to dump some fuel. May we do that in this area during descent? Pickerel is surprised to learn so late that Swiss Air 111 needs to dump fuel. At that point, it became more of a complicated situation. In fact, with every transmission after that, it became more and more complicated. Pickerel considers his options for a safe place that won't take the aircraft too far from Halifax. He decides to direct the aircraft over St. Margaret's Bay, about 30 miles from the airport. 
dropping fuel is standard procedure. A fully fueled jumbo jet is too heavy and could break up on landing. Are you able to take a turn back but co-pilot Low wonders if given their situation, they might forego the regulations. They want us to turn to the south. Should we just forget about dumping and just land? No, dump it. Okay, we are able for a left or right turn to the south in order to dump. I initiated the vector back toward St. Margaret's Bay to start him in that direction. It indicated to me that, again, uh, it wasn't uh, a critical situation on board, that, in fact, he did have time to be able to go back and uh, dump his fuel over the water. Swiss Air 111, uh, Roger. Turn left, heading of uh, 200 degrees, and advise me when you're ready to dump. It'll be about 10 miles before you're off the coast. You will still be within about 25 miles of the airport. Roger, we are turning left, 200. In that case, we are going to descend to only 10,000 feet in order to dump the fuel. Roger, maintain 10,000. I'll advise you when you're over the water. It will be very shortly. Roger. Are you in the emergency checklist for air conditioning smoke? Yes. Uh, Swiss Air 111, say again, please. Uh, sorry, that was not for you. Swiss Air 111 was asking internally. Okay. Air speed is decreasing below 306. Level off speed here. Let's fly the plane as you see if that's stuff on. Swiss Air 111, continue left heading 180. We'll be off the coast in about 15 miles. Left heading 180, Roger. Swiss Air 111 and maintaining at 10,000 feet. Roger. Cabin bus off. Cabin bus off, Roger. The cabin bus switch knocks out all the lighting in the cabin. It is an indication for the passengers that something is wrong, but hardly alarming. Ladies and gentlemen, we have temporarily lost the lights in the cabin. Please remain calm. The crew will be coming around with flashlights to assist in landing. Despite a cockpit filled with smoke, there is still no trace in the passenger cabin. <laughs> you will be staying within about uh, 35, 40 miles of the airport if you have to get back to the airport in a hurry. Okay, that's fine with us. Please tell us when we can start to dump the fuel. Suddenly, the MD-11 sends out a warning that the smoke is a sign of a more serious problem. Autopilot disconnect! Copy that, autopilot disconnect! Swiss Air 111! The fire has now reached the plane's autopilot, and this is just the beginning. 10,000... Uh, 11,000 and 900,000 feet! Swiss Air 111, you can block between 5,000 and 12,000 if you wish. One by one, systems all over the aircraft fail. In seconds, the calm in the cockpit dissolves. Between 12 and 5,000 feet, we are declaring emergency now, Swiss Air 111, at time 0124. The two pilots speak simultaneously. Combined with other distractions in the control room, Pickerel is unable to hear a critical transmission. Lowe's declaration that they must land immediately. We are dumping fuel now. We must land immediate. Swiss Air 111, just a couple more miles. I'll be right with you. Roger that. And we're declaring emergency now, Swiss Air 111. Missing this transmission is a moment Bill Pickerel relives today. I'm not sure that it's a feeling that you can adequately describe. I recall reviewing the events of that night a thousand times to determine if there was something additionally that I could have done or if there was uh, some mistake that I might have made or was there any way that I contributed to this. And eventually I was able to come to the point of realization that there wasn't anything that I could have done, uh, that everything that could have was done. Now, there is nothing to do but wait. I'm just flying and nothing else. 30 seconds after declaring emergency, the pilots of Swiss Air 111 face an inferno. All my screens are down. I'm flying on standby instruments, maintaining 300. Swiss Air 111, you are cleared to commence your fuel dump on that track and advise me when your dump is complete. Swiss Air 111, check. You are cleared to start the fuel dump. There is no further communication from the aircraft. Six minutes later, Residents of Peggy's Cove hear a deafening explosion. No one knows.
knows what happened to 229 people after 360 seconds of silence. It was probably one of the most helpless feelings that any individual can have, not being able to do anything but just sit and watch the target and hope that it would turn back toward the airport. And of course it didn't. Would-be rescuers glimpse the terrible remains of Swiss Air 111. Only one human body is discovered intact. In Geneva, Ian Shaw has a premonition about his 23-year-old daughter, Stephanie. That night, the night on which she was due to return, for reasons I can't explain even now, I was restless and I was disturbed, and um, I uh, slept early and woke uh, while my wife was still awake and asked her if she had had news of Stephanie. No, she had not, but she didn't expect to have news of Stephanie. We knew she was coming on that flight and that she would certainly expect me to be at the airport to fetch her in the morning. I awoke uh, around six Geneva time, and on television there was a report of the crash of Swiss Air 111 and I knew instantaneously that we had lost our daughter. The Transportation Safety Board of Canada launches what will become the largest air disaster investigation in the nation's history. They only know that Swiss Air 111 experienced a cockpit fire, but what caused it remains a mystery. Well, this accident was a challenging one to investigate in that initially, of course, we had to recover the aircraft from about 55 meters of water, around 185 feet. Of course, it was also in many pieces. Uh, as it turns out, it was in a couple of million pieces. So that was the initial challenge. And then after that, of course, uh, when you have so many pieces, you need to de determine which are the relevant ones and what are these pieces telling you about what happened and why. TSB embarks on a complex, multi-stage plan. First, divers are deployed to survey the wreckage. They discover that the plane is smashed into millions of pieces. As fall weather worsens, the risk to divers increases. At this rate, the investigation will take years to complete. Stage two. With help from the United States Navy, remote operated vehicles begin a more detailed search. The ROVs help investigators survey the site. But the question remains, how to recover tiny pieces of twisted metal from the bottom of the sea? Out of the wreckage, the first breakthrough emerges, Swiss Air 111's black boxes. Recordings of cockpit and computer data tell investigators that everything on the plane was working perfectly until the last few minutes. When the crew declared the pan, 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 that they had smoke in the cockpit, after going through all of these parameters, uh, we found no anomalies or no problems in any of that flight data that suggested there was a problem with the aircraft. So this led us to believe that the crew had a relatively operational aircraft. Aside from the, the smoke in the cockpit that they noted, uh, everything else appeared to be working fine. And uh, as they were making their plan to, uh, to send the aircraft, they experienced a series of systems failures that were in rapid succession and exponential. Poole's CVR team then faces a serious setback. The last six minutes on both flight recorders are missing. You're losing systems rapidly on the airplane in that 90 second period that things are happening very fast. And the last thing we, one of the last things we know about was the two recorders went offline. So the fire has uh, presumably breached the lines, breached the, uh, breached the sources to these recorders and has stopped them. With the failure of the black boxes, investigators are no closer to learning how or where the fire started on Swiss Air 111. Stage three, barges are deployed to scour the seabed for evidence. One by one, sad remnants of the airplane reach the surface. One of her engines. Then the landing gear. 
These are among the largest pieces of Swiss Air 111 to be recovered. The rest are mere fragments, dredged up in a painfully slow process. Stage four, a nearby military hangar provides a makeshift lab for the growing team of forensic investigators. Among them are representatives from the American NTSB, Boeing, Swiss Air, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Pieces of Swiss Air 111 arrive by the truckload. They are organized into various categories for analysis. Soon the hangar is stacked to capacity with the biggest jigsaw puzzle in the TSB's history. How did a seemingly small cockpit fire suddenly turn to catastrophe? The team sorts through nearly 250 kilometers of wiring retrieved from the wreckage of Swiss Air 111. Here, the first real clue, evidence of fire caused by electrical arcing. Scorch marks on metal reveal that the source of the fire was in the back of the cockpit, directly behind First Officer Lowe. An examination of the aircraft's wiring plans leads investigators to a likely suspect, the entertainment system in first class. The system had some major deficiencies. It was getting very hot. It drew a lot of power. And uh, thereby, for example, raising the cabin, uh, cabin temperature uh, considerably, because it was always running. They did not install a simple off switch, nor did they install appropriate cooling systems to cool the system down. The TSB's investigators finally think they have the breakthrough they've been seeking. When Captain Zimmerman threw the cabin bus switch, all power to the cabin should have been turned off, but the entertainment system remained on, overheating. If you'd ask most pilots, they would say, well, if I push the cabin butt switch, it's going to turn off the things behind the cockpit. It's going to isolate that electrically for me so that I don't have to worry about that and then I can just concentrate on those things that might affect me flying the airplane. Well, as it turns out, that this switch was kind of bypassed in, in this case for this IFN or, or entertainment system. Swiss Air immediately disables the entertainment system on the rest of its fleet. But the TSB concludes that the mystery is not solved. By the time that cabin switch was turned off, the fire was well underway, and uh, so that had no real um, bearing on the, the initiation or propagation of the fire in the Swiss Air 111 aircraft. Investigators determined that the problem with the entertainment system alone could not have brought down Swiss Air 111 the search for answers must continue. Stage five, the TSB decides to reconstruct the MD-11 from the wreckage. A wireframe mock-up they call the jig provides a spine for placing tiny pieces back where they once belonged. The reconstruction reveals that the hidden fire spread from the cockpit back into the first class galleys. Some metal showed heat damage from temperatures as high as 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. As the investigation continues, some argue that the actions of the pilots may have contributed to the disaster. Some experts charge that Zimmerman and Lowe's by the book approach may have cost them their lives. Some operators emphasized in a very early stage land as soon as possible, and then if you have time, go into the checklist. Others uh, said, here's the checklist, and at the end of the checklist, if that doesn't help, then land as soon as possible. Pretty contradictory to basic flying instructions where student pilots uh, learn at a very early stage that whenever you have smoke, you have a fire, and fire means land as soon as possible. Emergency light switch on. Emergency light switch on. Unfortunately, in this case, the way the checklist was written, it didn't identify that now start towards the divert. It started more on, let's try to see if we can solve the problem. And uh, so now all of a sudden you're taking on a problem that just kind of crept up on you. You weren't expecting it. Uh, we're gonna need more than 30 miles. But the TSB considers the timeline. Investigators determined that Swiss Air 111 would not have made Halifax Airport under any circumstances. There just wasn't enough time. In our calculation, uh, we uh, showed that starting at the ideal descent point from 33,000 feet, 
uh, which was uh, at about uh, 10, 14 p.m. that night. It would take some 13 minutes to get the airplane onto the ground, which would take us to 10, 27 p.m. By 10, 24, the systems in the aircraft were starting to deteriorate. So we believe that under these circumstances, uh, the crew would not have been able to successfully land the airplane under those conditions with the amount of time that they had. Whatever caused the fire on Swiss Air, it happened at a lethal speed. The mystery lingers. A year passes, then another ambitious operation begins. The TSB hires a sophisticated Dutch salvage ship, Queen of the Netherlands. The vessel is equipped with a gigantic vacuum system, capable of dredging even the tiniest pieces of Swiss Air 111 from the ocean floor. A mixture of seawater, silt, and aircraft are pumped into the ship's central hold. This cargo is then pumped into a specially constructed reservoir on shore nearby. When the gushing water drains away, investigators find another million pieces of the aircraft. Any one of them may hold the clue to what caused the catastrophic fire. The tedious sorting once again resumes and goes on for weeks. Finally, after 15 months, they find what they've been seeking, one faulty wire. We looked at all of the possible sources of uh, heat that might start a fire in that area. And in this instance, um, we did uh, discover a wire that uh, arced in that way. And right next to it was some very flammable material called uh, metallized polyethylene terephthalate covering material that uh, covers the insulation blankets. The insulation blankets which line the MD-11 are common on commercial airlines worldwide. They have passed the industry's flammability tests, which require materials to self-extinguish after a reasonable period of time. The investigation takes an abrupt turn. Instead of seeking the cause of the fire, the TSB now focuses on the flammable materials that fueled it. This thermal acoustical material that was in this aircraft was very flammable, even though it passed a test. It does sustain and it does propagate flame. So this investigation did focus on the flammability of materials and the requirement to reassess the criteria that is used to certify materials, not just thermal acoustical insulation blanket material, but also other materials that goes into aircraft, much of it in hidden areas. Now they have their answer. A wire arced in a closed space behind the cockpit. The arc ignited the insulation, which in turn lit other materials, such as foams and plastics. The pilots could not sense how quickly the fire intensified. But 14 minutes after they declared pan, 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 the fire disabled all electronics in the cockpit. The black boxes went dead. Forensic examination also helped shed light on the desperate final minutes in the cockpit. Lowe was in his seat. Captain Zimmerman was not, likely fighting the fire and probably dead before impact. The uh, first officer was probably trying to find a place where he could put this big airplane. Um, he just didn't have a lot going for him. He didn't have a lot of instrumentation left. And I'm sure he was looking for something, some indication that would give him an idea of where he could put the airplane down, maybe even ditch the airplane. What is known is that the first officer was in his seat. Whether he was uh, unconscious, conscious, maybe had severe degree burns on his skin, it's not known. We know the captain was not in his seat, so very likely he was trying to fight the fire. That the checklists were found uh, molten together, the pages, indicates that they were used to fight a fire. At 10.30, Lowe shut down engine two. Investigators determined that he likely received a warning that the engine was on fire. Chillingly, it proved that Lowe was alive a minute before impact. They could not determine whether the passengers were aware of the fire, at least until the very final moments. There were traces found of soot and smoke extending as much far to the business class overhead area. Whether the passengers have smelled the smoke, it's not known. 
uh, DNA analysis showed that they had no residue in their body. The aircraft hits the water with a force of 350 Gs. The TSB spends four and a half years and 40 million US dollars, the largest air disaster investigation in Canada's history. Their conclusion is one powerful message. Flammable materials do not belong on commercial aircraft. The rate of progression in this airplane, I think, surprised us and surprised uh, others. Uh, and uh, that's why we emphasize, again, the importance of um, raising the bar on the flammability standards for materials used in airplanes. Ian Shaw waited four years for the report to tell him what small flaw took the life of his daughter. But the truth has not extinguished his anger at Swiss Air. There has to be accountability. If you are involved in wrongdoing, you must be held accountable. And you must declare your sense of respons responsibility. Otherwise, you are hiding. And you are hiding, in this case, behind the flag of Switzerland. I think it's unbelievable. In the aftermath of the disaster, Swiss Air decides to remove the flammable insulate from its entire fleet. They also make changes to checklist procedure, reducing response time in a cockpit smoke emergency. But plagued with financial problems, the mighty airline shocks the industry when it goes bankrupt in October 2001. The flammable insulation that sets Swiss Air ablaze remains in two-thirds of commercial airlines today, but not for very much longer. The metallized polyethylene terephthalate material has been essentially banned from aircraft and the criteria to certify that kind of material for use in airplanes has been worked on. It has not been put into law as yet, but uh, we look forward to that being done, so the criteria is more stringent. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration has given a deadline of 2005 to remove the material from all commercial aircraft. This major overhaul aims to ensure the Swiss Air tragedy will not be repeated. For Ian Shaw, losing his daughter so suddenly and violently has left a permanent emotional scar. He left his wife and his wealth behind in Geneva and now runs a modest restaurant in Nova Scotia in view of the sea where his daughter died. Why would I come here to this particular point in Nova Scotia? A lot of people have said, oh yes, we fully understand you want to be close to your daughter and, and uh, the point where the plane crashed. That is no part of my being here. Swiss Air um, ripped out of me any possibility of proximity to my daughter. I found a comfort in the awareness of the presence of the eternal ocean, the ocean which has been going backwards and forwards for many, many, many thousands, millions of years. I came here because I had to. Um, I. I can't give a fully rational declaration to you of why I came here. I can only say to you, I am in the right place for the wrong reasons. <laughs>